What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Headphones Neil Reviews. I'm your host as always, Headphones Neil, bringing you my reviews for this particular week. So we got a couple of different major reviews to go through and then a couple of progress reports for a rewatch I'm doing and the current video game that I'm on. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. So to start it off, uh, last week I found out that this year is the 50th year anniversary for Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon, so I thought I would give the movie a rewatch just to see how it holds up, fill in the blank spaces for my memory of the movie. I could have sworn I'd seen the whole thing, but um, there was a lot of stuff in the middle that I didn't quite remember, so things like Chuck Norris being in the movie, um, kind of the overall plot aside from the bad guy being on an island. So um, I gave it a rewatch and overall I want to say that aside from the period that it was actually filmed in, for the most part the film holds up. Um, the biggest comparison I want to make for the movie is that you can see how films like Mortal Kombat drew their influences from this movie because you have a lot of parallels in both films. You have the main villain having his um, main base of operations on an uh, island. The good guys, the important players or the heroes of the day go to that island on a boat. Um, as far as character comparisons, you have things like um, the American Roper is a lot like Johnny Cage. Um, Bruce Lee is the Liu Kang character. Um, Han the bad guy is kind of a mix of the Emperor and Shang Tsung. Um, Tanya is a little bit like Sonya Blade and Bolo Young is kind of the Goro of the character. So essentially if you take out the supernatural science fiction parts of Mortal Kombat, then you would have a movie like Enter the Dragon. So you can see how Mortal Kombat takes kind of the spirituality aspect of what you see in Enter the da Dragon as far as the monks and the martial arts and all of that and then takes it to another level to um, expand on that a lot and take it to another level. So for me watching the film now, like I said, overall it was a good film. It, they kept it very tight at about, I think it was like 90 or 95 minutes. So not an overly long film. Um, and you get enough character development between the characters. They all end up meeting, talking, figuring stuff out. Um, I did like the relationship with, uh, that Roper had with, um, Bruce Lee and um, the African American guy. So all of that was very well done in this film. So I definitely recommend giving it another watch. Um, it does make me want to go back and watch a few other Bruce Lee films. I may have seen them over the years, but like in this case, um, although some of the pieces that I that I do remember need to be filled in with the parts of the film that I don't remember so part of it might just be I haven't seen the movies in a long time but also you know over the years watching it you know with friends or on the tv edits or whatever just pieces fall out of place and memories are lost for what I've actually seen so um overall like I said the movie holds up it's worth watching you can you get an early look at or a look at Bruce Lee's uh, martial arts abilities and all of that so with that being said, let's jump into the highlight piece for this week in that we finally have the season premiere for Ahsoka. So they did release episodes 1 and 2 simultaneously a day early on Tuesday um, and at 6 p.m. instead of the usual midnight. So you do, especially if you're on the Pacific coast of the United States, you get the, fil the show on Tuesday instead of having to stay up until midnight. And even like vice versa for the East Coast, you don't have to wait until early the following morning in order to um, get to watch the show. So I kind of like that whole idea. Um, to start it off, a lot of what we saw in the trailers was in these first two episodes, um, except for things like um, uh, Thrawn walking into the room, which lo looked a lot like the room that Sabine was healing in, I think, or one of those rooms that we saw in this shot on Lethal. 
But for the most part, I thought that the show, the first two episodes were really, really good. We have things like HK droids, which did not look really, very much like HK-47. So these might have been, you know, derivatives, uh, knockoffs. They went on, they underwent a lot of remodeling, refurbishing, and that sort of stuff. So I'm not sure exactly how they fit into stuff or they, they were, you know, just because it's, you know, now that we're, you know, thousands of years, of years later and these are the current models versus the traditional look of, you know, an HK-47 or HK-50 or whatever it was in Knights of the Old Republic 1 and 2. Um, and then we had an interesting reference to Knights of the Old Republic 2 in the form of the Eye of Scion. So I was reading a lot of stuff online where they said that this relates to Darth Scion from Knights of the Old Republic 2. So I wonder if the ship they were on was his refurbished ship from the uh, video games, if there was a cult of, you know, Scionists that followed his ways um, over years and years, if um, these were people from his home world or something like that to continue to follow him or something like that. So um, we'll see how that all fits into place or if anything comes of it, but I just thought that was an interesting note. Um, I did like the whole concept of the star map. Um, that was a very good live action translation of what we saw from Knights of the Old Republic 1. So they're going to go on this journey of discovery to find out what happened to Thrawn. So I'm still holding to my theory that they're going to mix the idea of the star maps with the Worlds Beyond Worlds theme from Star Wars Rebels and use that to find Thrawn. Or um, I imagine, you know, the Scionist that I'm going to call the Dark Jedi um, Sith people and then their boss lady are going to use the star maps to find Thrawn, bring him back, um, or send a message to him that his time to return has arrived. And then I like, you know, the look of, you know, for example, Ahsoka's look was really well done. I thought it feels like they improved it quite a bit versus how she looked in the Mandalorian. Um, mostly because I liked how her um, head tails, her Lekus, I think, uh, looked a little bit more natural on her head. Um, whatever force perspective they were doing with her compared to the other characters looked a lot better to give her a better idea of height. Um, just generally speaking, because she's generally been a little bit shorter of, or had a smaller frame compared to other people. So in the series, in the team, in the Ahsoka show, she looked a lot better compared in size compared to other people, especially when looking at her in shows like The Clone Wars and uh, Rebels. Um, the look of Sabine kind of bothered me a little bit, but once she got into her armor, it was fine. Um, so basically her look in episode one made me want to switch um, the actress who plays Sabine and the actress who plays um, Hera to switch to see if that would be a little bit better. But in the second episode, it seems like they fixed it a little bit by the time they got Sabine to put on her armor. So I think it's all good. The actresses they picked for each character are really well done. So um, overall, as far as visuals go on the characters, I like them very much. Um, and then, of course, uh, seeing Chopper in live action was a good touch. Um, I liked the conversation with him and Hera about who moved his stuff. Um, his general arm um, anime or visuals compared to the animations in uh, Rebels. It, I basically, I didn't have a question about that translation. It looked good to me. It was good to see him in live action. So, like I said, the visuals in Ahsoka seem really, really well done. Where it seems like they translated that or they learned, you know, from things like um, the um, Cad Bane in The Mandalorian and or now I forget if it was in The Mandalorian or Boba Fett, but um, it seems like they learned from that point to now on uh, improving the visuals. So all of that seemed very interesting. Um, the only downside to me was I was kind of questionable about the lightsaber battles, but the flip side is that if um, Ahsoka has been in hiding all this time, then She's going to be a little bit rusty. She's not going to be, you know, up to her full speed and par of how she was during Rebels and the Clone Wars. So we'll see if they build upon that going forward. But um, all in all, I'm curious to see how they progress the show week over week and where they take it from here, how they introduce Thrawn and what happens by the end of the season. So with that being said, we'll see what happens from next week. But overall, I give it a generally positive rating and I do enjoy watching the show. 
Um, now, as far as rounding out the episode, the first of two updates that I have is that I am continuing to watch Stargate SG-1, so I have finished seasons two and three, so um, I've been able to push through them a lot faster than I expected. Um, season two was okay for the most part. There wasn't a whole lot to talk about overall, but we do get the introduction of the or a bigger introduction for the Asgard. We have Colonel O'Neill going to the um or on one of their missions to find his way back to the one of the um Asgardian worlds to get the knowledge of the ancients out of his head. So oddly enough, that is one of my favorite episodes of the initial seasons called the Fifth Race. Um just because it introduces us to a larger universe, brings in the Asgard, introduces the idea of the Ancients, and just General O'Neill's overall dip diplomatic abilities, and then the trust that the Asgard place in him starts here. So um, overall a good season, so that's kind of the jumping off point there. As far as season three goes, it has a little bit more going on. So we have things like um, Captain Carter being promoted to Major. We have our characters going into the Gould representation of Hell, who is led by the Gould Sokar. So I thought that was particularly interesting. Um, we have the reemergence of Apophis, so he's another threat. But then we also have the introduction of the Replicators as a threat. So a few things going on here, but we have the show leaping off from its original, not necessarily no direction, but kind of expanding the direction it's taking to the galaxy as a whole. Now that, you know, Earth has established itself as the, its ability to handle themselves, have diplomatic ties and, you know, explore and all of that. So we have the Asgard and the Replicators on one side, the Gould on the other, um, the to interactions with the Tok'ra and all of that. So a lot of different things going on, but a lot of things are falling into place for all of that to happen. Um, so we also haven't had too much, or we did have a little bit of um, with Colonel Mayborn in the third season, but not too much with Senator Kinsey, so it's about time for him to re return as well. So I don't remember when his stuff continues to progress with the, difficult, the character development with Colonel O'Neill, but um, I'm starting on season four now, so we'll see how all of that progresses and what happens there. And then to round it out, um, I did have a chance to start playing Brutal Wolfenstein 3D, the Doom 2 mod that adds the Brutal effect that we saw in Brutal Doom 1, but to Wolfenstein 3D. So I did take a quick look to see if I could play Wolfenstein 3D on a mobile device, but I didn't see an easy way to do that. So I thought, well, maybe there's a Brutal Wolfenstein 3D mod, and turns out there was. So I'm playing the mod by a developer called uh, Zero McCool or Zero McCall, something like that. The mod is up to version 7, so it's still, as far as I could tell, it does require the Doom 2 WAD. Um, so I am still playing the game using Delta Touch on Android, using the GZ Doom uh, port. So um, same, similar controls to um, uh, Brutal Doom. The main thing here is that I didn't, or there was a toggle for reload, but I didn't see a way to um, map that by key binding to my Razer Kishi. So I'm not sure if it's just not an option or because the original game does not have a manual reload that they didn't translate that over to the port. But looking at videos online, it does look like there were people doing reloads or reloading their weapons. So I wonder if that's maybe more of a desktop thing versus a uh, mobile thing. But in any case, it's not a huge deal. It just requires a little bit of rethinking of how to play. So hiding around the corner between doors, paying attention to um, the ammunition count in the weapons, switching over to fists to punch out enemies, so things like that. But so far I'm a few levels into the game. I'm still on the first um, chapter, Escape from Wolfenstein, so um, all of the progress updates can be followed on the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash patelin01. But overall it is a um, about as fun of a game as Brutal Doom. It does modernize a lot of the graphics and gameplay as well. So for me, things like if you look at Wolf Assign 3D's original game, um, there's no ceilings, which um, is more of a uh, 
limitation of the game for when it was released, but Brutal Doom expands on that and, you know, adds things like dynamic lighting, colors to the ceiling, more animations and blood and gore and things like that. So it does look a lot more modern and brings it up to par with a game like Doom. So there's very little that you would miss between the two. Um, aside from maybe a few graphical differences, maybe, but overall you would think that they were maybe released in the same year. And you know, one was a mod for the other or something like that. But overall, it's a fun game to play. The biggest issue that I'm getting over right now is that these levels are a lot more maze-like. So this would be more like a comparison of having the second or third chapter of Doom, maybe the second chapter of Doom um, being played as the first chapter in Wolfenstein 3D. So the levels are a bit intricate. There's a lot of doors and things to go around and tunnels and hallways and things like that. So I'm kind of taking the approach at the moment that the first pass around the um, level will be to go around, collect ammunition, take out the enemies, and along the way if I do find the key to exit the level, the perfect, and try to make a mental note of where the exit door is if I happen to pass it. Once I do that, then I'll go around and look for secret areas and then a way to exit the map once I have the key. Um, so that's kind of the um, main play style at the moment that will change i'll change it up if i need to but overall the levels are very maze like so it is very interesting but it also does kind of fall into the whole theme of the, cha the chapter that as bj blasco is the main character you're trying to escape from castle wolfenstein so you would not know where to go where anything is and you're going to run into all these random hallways as you find a way to exit the level so it, it kind of all falls into place so there's that um, so that's all there is for this review, so I'm currently expecting that by next week's episode I will have finished at least the first chapter of uh, Wolfenstein 3, or Brutal Wolfenstein, so Escape from Wolfenstein, and I'm also hoping to have started the next chapter, but um, also I hear, just reading online, that the theory is that um, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is expected to release on streaming next week. So if it does and it's available on places like Disney Plus or available somewhere else, so, you know, buy or rent, then I'm going to give that movie a watch as well and have that part of next week's review. I'm still planning on finishing the first chapter of Escape from Wolfenstein. Um, so at least there's that, but I'll probably put a little bit of the watch through of Stargate SG-1 on hold or, you know, watch as I have time, but mostly focus on Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny if it releases, but then also Ahsoka, so we'll see how it goes next week, but that's kind of the pseudo update now, depending on if um, Dial of Destiny releases next week or not. But that is all for this particular episode, so if you have any questions, comments, feedback, um, or anything like that, you can comment on the social media sites that I'm on, uh, which are all linked at headphonesneal.reviews. Um, you can also subscribe to the show, get links to past episodes and all of that, which are also on the website. Um, and if you want to get ad-free versions of the show, early access to the podcast and video versions um, before they're released to the public, you can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash But that is all for this particular episode. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time.